As TJ mentioned, I'm, I'm Robert. Uh, I work at LaunchDarkly. And um, I want to start by situating what I'm going to talk about within experimentation. So experimentation um, comprises a lot of different pieces. So um, one piece is just like experiment design. So you got to get like the design of the experiment, right? What, what are your hypotheses? Um, what metrics do you expect to move and in which direction? Um, and like what behaviors do you expect from your users? And then you're going to do some traffic allocation. So you're going to say, OK, what is my risk tolerance for this experiment? Do I want to expose it to 100% of users or 10% of users? Um, do I want to only experiment on people on iPhone, or do I want to experiment on everyone? Then you have like a logging component. So logging, you, you want to make sure that you know who is actually exposed to the treatment and who isn't. Um, you don't want to just have everybody in your experiment analysis because you'll have very noisy data. You also want to get those metrics that are associated with the behaviors that you have. And then you have like uh, data processing. So you, all this logging goes through your data pipeline. You do things like deduping, aggregation. Uh, then you throw some statistics models on there. And then maybe you have a UI for visualizing it. And maybe, maybe there's some even in the visualizing piece, there's some like feedback loop that you run more statistical models on. So this is one, one way of sort of breaking down the pieces of experimentation. I'm going to talk um, a bit about this today. And then I'm going to talk about why getting this right allows you to do uh, better things here. Um, I'll say that originally when I uh, proposed this talk, I, I mentioned that I, I'd be happy to talk on randomization or allocation or multi-armed bandits. And uh, Chester was like, oh, how about all three? Uh, and luckily, they, they all fit together really well. So this is the sort of areas of experimentation I'm going to be focusing on. And the reason uh, I, I titled this Beyond T-Tests is because for a lot of organizations, the first step in experimentation is just setting up stats and running it on some existing data that maybe like engineers provide. Uh, and you hope it's randomized well, but you're just running T-Tests maybe in like a Python notebook or even, you know, Excel spreadsheets. Um, and then like, what are the next sort of things you should be thinking about? One of them really is how you're getting that data upstream. So that randomization and traffic allocation component. Cool. So now that we're sort of situated, uh, let's just say what we're generally talking about. So allocation, what I mean by allocation is you have these various users. They come to your website or they're using your app. And for an experiment, you want to allocate them to some treatment. So let's say you're doing like a blue button color, sort of classic uh, A-B test, blue button color versus, say, a red button color. Actually, we're going to make this purple. So how do you allocate users to these different treatments? Um, so one thing you, you could do is, let's say that you do a sample size calculation, and it says that you need 10,000 people in your experiment in order to see statistical significance for a particular effect size. So you might say, OK, what I'll do is I'll take the first sort of 5,000 people and I'll assign them to blue, and I'll take the next 5,000 people and assign them to purple. And you sometimes see these in like, especially email experiments. Um, so what's, what's the challenge with this? Well, I mean, imagine that the first 5,000 people come in between say like 9 a.m. and noon, and the second 5,000 come in between noon and 3 p.m. So a really obvious case where this might be misleading is, let's say that your app allows you to order lunch. You're probably going to get more people in this first group ordering lunch than in the second group. So what that means is that people in this group are going to be ordering lunch at a higher rate. Maybe it's 5% over this. But if you're trying to figure out whether or not blue is better than purple, the fact that you have these users in this treatment is actually uh, causing your data to be misleading. 
it's not blue that's causing the plus 5%. It's the fact that the people order lunch between 9 and noon versus between noon and 3. So um, how can we do better than this? Oh, and so actually, I want to say what this is sometimes referred to. Um, so these are referred to as confounds. And they're just like, there's some attributes that these users have that these users don't. And this is something we want to avoid when we're doing traffic allocation. We want everyone to be sort of equally represented between each um, treatment. So another option you could do is maybe you can do a round robin approach. So the first person gets assigned to blue, second person to purple, third person to blue, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this one is a little less obviously bad, but one way how you, you can think about how this might be wrong is that um, suppose there is an attribute that um, affects every other person. No matter how many times you randomize, you're always going to have that affect your experiment. Let me explain that a little bit more in depth so we can motivate the next option. So imagine that um, I run another experiment and I randomize again with round robin. Well, maybe this time the first users are going to purple and the second to blue. So odd or uh, sorry, odd are going to purple and even are going to blue. But no matter how many times I randomize, it's either one set going to one treatment or the other set going to another treatment. There's never enough randomization to mix those groups together. So if there is a potential confound there, you can never get away from it. Uh, so this, I mean, sometimes people will say what you want is like, maximum entropy with respect to your randomization and the number of, uh, or the distribution of users that you have. Um, so that you're, you're sort of guaranteed that uh, if there is a confound, here's something that um, you should think, you know, it is possible, like let's say you just completely randomized it. It is possible that you just by chance end up with all iPhone users in one group and all Android users in another group. Um, and sometimes people do some sort of like stratification to try to avoid that. Um, but, but one feature of randomization, which is what we really want, we want randomization, not like something like round robin or um, allocating the first 5,000 and the second 5,000. One feature of randomization is that the next time you randomize, you're very unlikely to get that, that break up, breakdown again. So like, let's say we just completely randomized it and um, just by luck, uh, this person is an Apple user. Uh, Steve Jobs is going to hate me for the Apple drawing. This guy is an Android user. I don't even know if that's still their logo. Um, and it turns out that, you know, just by luck, Android users all ended up in purple and Apple users all ended up in blue. Uh, the next time you randomize, yeah. Now there's a question from the uh, chat. Do you design the experiment diff differently if there is a delay in results, such as view an ad, then buying a product within 30 days? Um, so the randomization is still going to be the same. Uh, I can say actually something that might be a little bit different. Um, so let me, let me hold off on that question, because I'll talk a little bit about the unit of randomization and where that might come into play for that type of experiment. But this part will be the same, which is that what we want is we want a truly random allocation uh, for these different treatments. Um, where that comes into play is um, how you allocate. So, so I'm using users here, but you don't actually have to use users to do allocation. You can do like requests. So for every request, it's randomly assigned a treatment. Um, you can do user days. So for each user uh, and each day that they come, they could potentially be assigned a different treatment. Um, but I'm using users just for illustration. And in the case for that question, uh, you might need to use users if, if the metric that you're evaluating and the treatment aren't seen in the same day. So I'm using users as an example. That's a good um, way to do it if, you're, if the effect 
or the behavior that you expect is in the future. Um, but if you don't, if your sort of uh, exposure to the treatment and um, behavior are on the same day, then you can use something like the user day uh, allocation, as long as you're not worried about uh, carryover effects. So one way to randomize is um, for each user, you could just like flip a coin, right? This is this is good randomization. So heads, let's say heads goes to blue, and tails goes to purple. So for each user, you flip a coin, and if it's heads, you go to blue, tails, you go to purple. And even if you had more treatments, you could use something like a random number generator and just see where it falls uh, within a particular range. Um, but, you know, this case where we want users to be in the same treatment over time that we just talked about, one of the challenges is you don't want the user to come back and flip the coin again and have them see a different treatment if you want that treatment to be stable over any period of time. So one thing that you, you would have to do if you use this sort of allocation mechanism is you would have to somehow cache that a particular user ID was mapped to a particular treatment. And then if they were already mapped to that treatment, don't flip a coin. Um, but that can be actually quite memory intensive when you have you know, tens of millions of users across thousands of experiments. So we're going to land on what a better strategy is. And this is one of the, this is probably the most common strategy. Um, so the strategy that we want is we want some function that's deterministic. So let's say that we're using user ID for randomization. We want some function that gives us uh, essentially what treatment the user should be in. But the way we're going to get at that is we're going to have it give us uh, a 0 to a 1. And then if we say we want 50-50, we can do something like if this evaluates to less than, say, 0.5, uh, you get blue. So we'll say if f of x is less than 0.5, and then otherwise you'll get this purple. So we can do something like this. Okay. So what we want here is a deterministic function um, that uh, is also evenly distributed. So what I mean by evenly distributed or uniformly distributed is the output should be just as likely at any point between 0 and 1 uh, for any input. So um, it shouldn't be the case that like smaller user IDs are more likely to end up to the left or to the right. Whatever the input is, you should have just as much chance that it ends up uh, anywhere on this distribution. Um, so what I'll do is I'll start writing out what some of these criteria are that we uh, that we care about for this function. So one is it's deterministic. And two, it's uniformly distributed. Um, so so what is uh, what what's nice about this? It, what's nice about this is that uh, you don't have to cache the results of an allocation. So if this user is allocated to blue um, by virtue of getting less than 0.5, then the next time they refresh the page, if this is deterministic, they'll still be allocated to blue. But that means that if we're doing this evaluation every time they refresh, we also need this function to be very fast. So uh, I'll be adding a few more criteria here as well. Um, and so the mechanism, I'm not going to get too much into details, but the mechanism under the hood here is that you can hash a um, hash the user ID using a hashing function that satisfies these criteria. Uh, and then you convert it to uh, a number format, say an integer, and then you scale it to uh, the size of the range that you want uh, the output to be. So let me stop there and see if there are any questions.
Uh, someone asks, I, I saw something pop up. I'm not able yep. to read the chat too well, but I saw something pop up here. Yeah, I'll read it out for you. Um, this one, this question is, can you give examples of how you define a user ID, i.e. I. E., is it a cookie in web experiments? Yeah. So really, I'm using an example of user ID, but this input could be anything. It could be a cookie as well. So if you have a, a website where users aren't logged in yet, then you might put cookie ID here instead of user ID. And the nice thing about this function is it can take any input. It can be a number or a string. If it's a number, you end up just converting it to a string anyway before you hash it. Um, but it can take any input and give you this output. Um, another thing I mentioned earlier, like uh, you, like if if you don't need this treatment to be stable over multiple days, you could also do something like a user ID plus the day. Um, and if it's a user ID plus the day, then notice that it's deterministic for that combination. But the next day when the user comes back, they might be assigned another treatment. This is a way to get a larger sample size. So let's say you have a small user base, but they come to your website frequently. If you randomize by user ID plus the day that they visit or cookie ID plus the day that they visit, then for every uh, day that they visit, that's a sample. So if you have a thousand users over five days, your sample set size is 5,000 instead of 1,000. Um, so really this, this input, it can be anything but you do want to be careful. There are some things that you don't want to randomize on. So for example, uh, you wouldn't want to randomize on country because then you get into that same situation where everybody, since it's deterministic, everybody with the same country will end up in the same treatment. And then the confound or the potential confound is the, the country. So you want to make sure that um, the, the thing that you're randomizing on isn't a property that could influence the behavior um, of the user uh, for the, the metrics that you're looking at. There's so, a, there's a, oh, go ahead and finish your thought. And there's a follow-up. Really, this can be, this can be anything. Um, it's, it kind of depends on your experiment design. Um, so follow-up follow comment. Um, not sure if you're going to get to this, but each experiment would need to have a different function. One way to do this is to include an experiment ID as part of the input to F. Yeah, yeah, good. So uh, yeah, let's talk a little bit about that. So uh, I'm gonna use this representation a bunch. So let me say what it's representing. It's representing 100% um, uh, of users. And remember we said if, if you land on 0.5 or less, then we're going to give uh, you to blue. And if you land on 0.5 or greater, we're going to give you to purple. So, um, so yeah, so what happens here? Um, cool. So what happens if you want to run multiple experiments? So one way that uh, multiple experiments are handled is you actually need to share this traffic, right? So what you want to say is that um, I want to run two experiments. So the first half I'll give to experiment one, the second half I'll give to experiment two, and now I have blue here and purple here, and maybe I have like some text here, text one and text two. Uh, and um, I've worked at very large places where this is the approach they take. Basically, you're saying that no two experiments could ever overlap. That means that if you're in one experiment, you can't ever possibly be in another experiment. But this has some pretty significant scaling challenges. So one nice thing is it allows you to isolate the effects of your experiment. So they're not the effect sizes aren't mixed. But there's a challenge here, which is that let's say that experiment one finishes and we want to run another experiment. So now we want to run experiment three. Notice that experiment three is going to use that same traffic that experiment one used. That's actually problematic because of uh, something called a carryover effect. And um, a carryover effect is this idea that, let's say that um, the first experiment was uh, Pfizer versus Moderna. And the next experiment is, um, I don't know, Tylenol versus Advil. 
all of the people in your Advil treatment are going to have come from your Moderna treatment, and all of the people in your Tylenol treatment are going to come from your Pfizer treatment. Uh, so what's going to happen is um, maybe the, the effect that you notice when you end up running this experiment is influenced by the fact that they were in this previous experiment. So that's sort of a carryover effect. And you want to avoid that. And um, similar to what someone just mentioned, the way you can avoid that is add a parameter to your function. And the parameter that uh, is typically added is uh, like a seed or a salt. And what you can do is when you want to um, reuse this traffic, you actually change the seed. So like, let's say we started with seed one, two, three, we can change it to seed four, five, six. And what that does is it uh, re-randomizes all the traffic. Um, basically, another way of saying that is that your user IDs now map onto a different place in that range. But notice that actually you can't do that in this case because you don't want this to be re-randomized. You actually want these people to stay in the same experiment, but you don't want these people to be influenced by those previous treatments. Um, so it's a little bit tricky in this case, uh, but I'll talk a little bit about how to avoid that um, in a little bit. Um, but a, a sort of strategy that you sort of have to take with this uh, approach a lot is wait till all experiments end. Um, before you start new experiments so that you can re-randomize that traffic and you don't get these carryover effects. The place that I was at actually ended up just ignoring these carryover effects because the operational overhead was so high uh, for trying to get experiments to end at the same time. So, uh, so yeah, so now we're getting this sort of the traffic allocation piece. Uh, let me just check my notes to see if I want to say anything else about this. Oh, yeah. Um, we talked a little bit about hashing functions. Let me see if I... Let me... Um, so, so let me just talk about how this is referred to sometimes. So this, this area here is often referred to as a layer. And so what I described is like a single layer of experimentation system. where you always have to run the experiments uh, using that same set of traffic. Um, but you can actually have multiple layers. And with multiple layers concurrently, uh, what you can have is each layer has its own seed. Uh, let me just motivate why this is the case, though. So let's say that you have this layer and you're running this is for experiment one and you're running uh, the blue and purple and this is for experiment two and you're running that you know those two different text options if they both have the same seed notice that you have the same problem of needing to disambiguate the effect size so let's say that um, when you're looking at your experiment results t2 has you know average revenue of nineteen dollars, and T one has average revenue of ten dollars. If you just look at this experiment, the product manager is going to look at T two and say, "That's great, we're going to launch it." But the problem is because these are the same users here, it might actually be purple that's causing that effect size, uh, not T two. So what you really want to do is you want to mix this traffic proportionally into these um, treatments. So you can imagine like half of blue users go to T1, but the other half go to T2. And likewise with pur uh, purple, half go to T1, half go to T2. And the way you can achieve that is just by having different seats here. Um, but this, is, this actually motivates another criterion that you want for your hashing function. Um, hey, Robert, before yeah. you move on, there was a comment that I think is related to the layers you're just uh, describing. Sure. Uh, the comment is, um, uh, you probably want, let me see, what I built in the past was to have a two-layer system 
layer one for holdout group plus split between experiments, second layer to randomize between variants within the experiment. That allows uh, to keep the holdout experiment, the holdout stable among experiment. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the idea there, I guess, is that um, for the first layer, you can uh, hold out some traffic that is always like your baseline traffic, uh, I guess is what I'm hearing. And then the rest of the traffic um, goes to the second layer and that layer can use it for experimentation. That's um, also similar to something called like a shared control. Uh, you could do that even within layers. You could have a shared control that they all use to compare against to, to sort of use traffic efficiently. But with multiple layers, you could also have just in layers. Uh, I'm going to, um, it's a little bit difficult to share resources. So I think I'm going to tweet out some resources afterwards. But there's a good paper that's uh, an oldie but goodie. I, I still like it called um, Overlapping Experiments, I think, uh, by Google. Let me just write my uh, uh, Twitter handle here. I'll tweet out some resources. Uh, but that's a good white paper that talks about uh, overlapping experiments. It, it's just Robert J. Neal, so it's pretty easy. Um, but yeah, you can have some in layers uh, in a layered experimentation system. But remember, one of the things that we said we wanted was, um, I sort of briefly mentioned this and I didn't write it up here. One of the things we want is, let's say that we're using user ID, but these user IDs are uh, sequential, like they're um, auto-incrementing, right? We want to make sure that those IDs aren't um, correlated to the output. So the fact that these are sequential shouldn't mean that um, the output is sequential. And it actually shouldn't even mean that they're near each other. So we want to make sure that uh, one of the things that our hashing function satisfies is that the input and output are not correlated. Um, and then it actually gets a little bit more tricky with multiple uh, layers. So uh, there's a, another paper that I'll include um, where um, Yahoo moved to a multi-layer system and they were using a hashing function. So inside of this function here, they were using a hash, hashing function called F in V. And what they found was that it was not correlated. The input and output was not correlated. So it satisfied this criterion. But when they changed seeds, the output um, uh, with different seeds was correlated. So if, if your user ID was one and your seed was one, two, three, let's say that you ended up in the first half, then you're more likely to end up in the first half when your seed is four, five, six. So this is bad for the same reasons that we need different seeds. The probability that you end up in this first half because you ended up in this half uh, should be the same as the probability that you end up in this half in general. Sorry, that's just like saying the conditional probability should be same as the probability because the fact that you ended up here shouldn't um, matter with respect to whether where you end up in this allocation. But in fact, with F and V, um, there was a correlation. So it's not just that they're not correlated. They need to be not correlated even uh, with different seats. So this is, this is important when you do layered experimentation. Okay. So I'll just, I'll just mention a couple of hashing algorithms that are um, good. Uh, so the one that I've used the most is Murmur 3. Uh, and I, I think that's pretty common. Uh, it satisfies all of these criteria. Um, uh, SHA-1 is used sometimes. It's less fast than Murmur 3, but um, for most applications, the speed is fine. Uh, you really only probably care when you're doing something that's like um, 
network level uh, randomization that you might want Murmur 3 performance instead. And it's something that we've been looking at recently is XX hash, uh, which is um, even better than Murmur 3 with respect to performance characteristics. One of the challenges with XX hash, uh, and the reason that we haven't implemented it is we have SDKs in a bunch of different languages, and it's not yet implemented uniformly across all the languages that we have our SDKs in. But these are all reasonable um, hashing algorithms to use within this function here. Cool, let me stop there and see if there are any questions. None from the chat. Uh, yeah, I guess one thing that I forgot to put here with respect to criteria is that it needs to be random, right? That's important. Um, that means that uh, that's kind of like saying that the input and output are not correlated, I guess. Cool. So, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about some gotchas with traffic allocation. So we talked about, you know, this being a place where you're allocating traffic. So you might think, well, suppose I have multiple variations. How, how should I represent those, how those variations fall here? So one, one approach you might take, let me just clean this up a little bit so it's not so noisy. One approach you might take is you might say, look, I have three different variations. So for A, I want to give it 33% of traffic. For B, I want to give it 33% of traffic. And for C, I'm going to give it the remaining 34% of traffic. And as long as these are consistently ordered, so if you have these ordinals, um, then you can say, OK, the first one is going to get this first 33%. The second one is going to get however much it wants. It wants 33%. And then the third one is going to get however much it wants, 34%. But uh, this is there's actually a slight challenge here. And I'll say that um, I work at LaunchDarkly. We provide this third-party experimentation system. There is a, a large third-party experimentation system out there that does just this and has this problem. Um, Suppose uh, you decide that A is not doing good. It's performing pretty poorly, so you want to kill it. C is doing really well, so you want to give that traffic to C. What, what does your representation end up looking like? Uh, A gets zero. B, you're saying, you know what, I want to keep it the same. And C, you're saying, I want to give it that extra traffic. So what does that look like with respect to the traffic that you're allocating, A gets zero, fine. You go to the second one, B, it gets the 33% that it wants, and then C gets the 67% that it wants. But notice that um, you're pulling all of the users that were getting B out of B and putting them in C, and these users had never seen B before. They used to get A. So, um, this is a sort of bad solution, but this is actually in like some help docs that you'll see for this particular piece of software. They say, here's, here's a solution. Make sure that you just order these uh, when you first set up the experiment so that this is second, this is first, and this is third. So now what you'll see is you get, uh, sorry, B first, A, and then C, and then notice that when you kill A, your users don't jump between treatments. But notice that this only works in the case where the experimenter is clairvoyant. You have to know that A is going to do poorly before you set up your experiment. Um, I think that's an unreasonable burden to put on an experimenter. And I think if you do find an experimenter who can do that, uh, you should definitely hire them right away because most experiments turn out to be duds, but this person knows that A is going to fail before they even run the experiment. So what's a better approach? The challenge here is that um, the traffic you're giving 
to these different treatments has to be contiguous. And what we want is discontiguous traffic. So we want the ability, we want some mechanism that allows us to uh, segment this so that I can have traffic for B, A, C, and then maybe traffic for B again. But the representation I was using before doesn't allow this, right? So instead, what I want to do is I want to think of this range as partitions. So I'm just going to label this as from zero. That color is not quite visible enough. From zero to 10,000. Um, this 10,000 could be 1,000, 10,000, 100,000. But just think what we're saying here is that that's how many partitions there are here. So you can think of just 10,000 partitions here. Then what you can do is assign these partitions to the treatments. So then what you'll be saying is A is actually getting uh, partitions 0 to 3, 3, 3, 3. B is getting partitions you know, 3, 3, 3, 3 to 6, 6, 6, 6. And then, of course, C will be getting, uh, this is actually 3, 3, 3, 4. Uh, six, 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 seven, two, nine, 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 nine. Um, and then notice if you use this approach, you could actually have multiple sets of partitions. So you, like, let's say that I wanted to take some of this traffic from here. I could have, you know, 5,000, uh, one to six, 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 six. And now we can have discontiguous partitions. And that, that actually allows us to do a lot uh, more than just avoid that situation that we got into before. Um, so for example, if you want to reuse traffic, like let's take that example where we had two experiments running and we want to reuse this traffic from a dead experiment. We don't want to get in a situation where if we increase T1 and T2, that we get something like T1, T2, T1, T2, because we're going to get those carryover effects. So we can smartly take these partitions and evenly distribute them, really not evenly, proportionally distribute them to these other variants. Um, so really, there's sort of no limit to how you can assign those partitions. And in fact, um, at LaunchDarkly in our code base, the allocation logic uh, there's quite a lot of allocation logic um, because we want to be able to efficiently use traffic in a way that doesn't introduce biases. Um, so this is a pretty common approach that you'll see for allocating traffic and it allows you to avoid the sort of pitfalls that um, I mentioned. Um, any questions up to this point? I'm going to jump into how this allows you to do multi-armed bandits uh, next, but I want to stop and see if there are questions thus far. Uh, there was a quick question we sort of got answered in the discussion already, but what is the difference between uniformly distributed and random? I think this goes back to the uh, criteria for your hash function. Yeah. Um, so you could have something that's uniformly distributed and not random. So like, let's just say that your input is all uh, integers and your distribution is all integers. You could map each integer onto itself, which would give you a uniform distribution, but it wouldn't be random. It'd be deterministic. So uniform just means that um, for each point on your x-axis, that the probability that you, you draw that point is equal across all these probabilities. I guess a good way to think about it is like a lot of people are familiar with normal distributions which are distributed like this. So you're more likely to hit the middle spots. Uniform just distribution just means you're equally likely to hit all spots. So we want it to be both uniform and um, random. Meaning that like, if it's a one, that one could end up anywhere on this X axis. Uh, and it's random where it ends up. Cool. Um, so now that we have these partitions, we can actually uh, use them 
to implement a multi-arm banded algorithm. And there's a specific multi-arm banded algorithm that this helps us unlock. I'll say that a lot of um, examples of multi-arm bandits that you see in blogs or online are uh, Thompson sampling. Um, but that's not the algorithm I'm, I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to be talking about something called epsilon greedy. And um, epsilon greedy is just named because you have epsilon, which is some uh, proportion of traffic that you want to use for exploring versus exploiting. And I'll explain what that means. So here's, here's basically how the algorithm works uh, in the context of this traffic allocation. You keep some traffic you set aside some traffic just for learning which variant is best. So let's say we have A, B, and C, and let's say that that's 15% of traffic. And then the other 85% of traffic, so this is the exploring traffic we're going to explore. This other traffic, we're actually exploiting what we've learned. So uh, to start, um, this is just allocated to treatment randomly. But as you collect data and you learn which of these variants is best, which one has the best metrics, you actually replace uh, this um, the treatment for this traffic with whatever's doing best. So let's say we look at it and C is doing best. We'll put C here. And then after a while, we're running it and it looks like B is doing best. Then we can put B here. Um, and then maybe A is doing best, we can go back and forth a bunch. Eventually, it'll converge on the right answer. Um, but you can just keep swapping those out. And notice that um, because you're using partitions, it makes this possible. But if you implemented your traffic allocation in a sort of naive way, where um, each one just maps to how much traffic you want and not to actual look partitions in your partition space, um, you wouldn't be able to do that, right? So this is a pretty simple algorithm um, that demonstrates you know, one of the reasons why uh, allocation is really important. And if you implement this partition strategy, it's actually really easy to implement uh, epsilon greedy algorithm. All you have to do is look at the metrics for each of these variants, um, and then whichever one's doing best, update this traffic allocation with that. And that's just, you know, that's just equivalent to saying, take this 85% uh, of traffic and move it between these different treatments. Um, and that will give you uh, some regret minimization for, for your traffic. So this is a, just write it up here, this is epsilon greedy algorithm, multi-arm bandit. Um, yeah. So I think that's where I wanted to stop to open it up for questions. Uh, there are some other reasons why partitions actually um, help you avoid different biases um, in your traffic allocation. Uh, we have a blog post on LaunchDarkly about two of them. One is called time varying effects and one is called carryover effects. Um, so that's a resource I can include as well. Uh, also include some of the papers I mentioned. Um, yeah, but for now, I think uh, opening up to questions is good. Robert, thank you for this uh, good presentation. Uh, very, very interesting. Uh, I have a question. Uh, is it related to a uh, time delay? Like we have some delay in getting results. I wonder for multi-armed uh, bandit, uh, do you initially send a large amount of data? Like uh, uh, so let them view the advertisements wait for two hours and then uh, according to the result allocate more to the B segment or you still do even it distribute every hour send a say send a 10k uh, advertisements out how do you handle that um let me say a couple of things I'm not 100 percent sure I'm understanding all of the aspects but I think one of the aspects was uh you don't see the metric for a while. Yes. Um, so that's fine. You only need to do this update when you get that information. But you can also, um, so uh, epsilon greedy is not a great example for this. Thompson sampling is a better example for 
if you, it sounds like you already have some information about what you think might do best that you can preload the multi-armed bandit with. If that's true, you probably want to use Thompson sampling because you can put um, priors on the distributions, uh, the distribution of traffic. So like Thompson sampling with ABC, essentially what you're doing is like, let's say that you don't have any information, you'll give them all equal traffic, but you're using 100% of the traffic. And then if A does better, what you do is like, you give A more traffic. And if B is doing worse, you give B less traffic. So um, if you already have data before you start, you probably want to use, you might want to use Thompson sampling. You could also um, uh, include the data in Epsilon Greedy uh, beforehand as well. So you can say like my starting um, reward, average reward for A is whatever you know it to be. Uh, you don't have to make these updates until you get the data. Another thing that you'll see in production systems, so um, uh, I've been at a couple companies where we've done this. Um, one of the challenges with multi-armed bandits is time varying effects, where if you respond to um, each data point that comes in, you're actually biasing it toward that day or that time of day. So like, let's say you start this on Monday and you find that A is the best. And so you're giving A all the traffic. A might just be the best because Mondays are really good. And then maybe Tuesdays through Fridays are really bad, but C is best on those days. Um, you've already given a bunch of your traffic A, so you're actually not really minimizing regret uh, in an optimal way. So one way of also not optimizing in an optimal way is, um, is to actually only make these updates on like whatever time interval your time during effects are. So for most places that's uh, weekly. So every week you might make the decision to update this. So that gives you some efficiencies over traditional A-B testing, um, but it allows you to avoid the worries about time during effects. I think, um, I think Optimizely has a blog post about handling like a statistical model for handling time during effects. Uh, I can't remember the details of that off the top of my head, but that might be also approach for doing that. Not sure if that answered all of your questions, but. Uh, Very helpful, thank you. Yeah, okay. Any, Any other, other questions? questions from the chat right now? Cool. All right, well, if there's no other questions, I guess we can wrap it up. All right, maybe just a, a slow slow count to three or something, see if anyone has any yeah. other questions. Yeah, I'm happy to hang out if there's more questions. Thank you, Robert. Yeah, no problem. Oh, uh, there is a question. No, oh, go ahead, Aaron, go ahead. I'll just ask. Okay. Yeah, we can we can do that instead of typing. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> what about multiple control groups? Um, have you ever uh, used multiple control groups? And if so, how does that impact the conclusion? Uh, for the same experiment or in the same layer? Within an experiment. So to say I have control one, control, control two, they're both equal. And then I have the treatment that we're, we're testing. Oh, okay. And what is the motivation for multiple controls? Is that like to figure out what the variance is or something? Yeah, quantify variance. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I guess I'm not, I'm not confident that using multiple controls is any better than just using that same amount of traffic. I mean, sometimes like uh, multiple controls is equivalent to AA and you sometimes hear that um, referred to as like a poor man's bootstrapping. Um, I guess if you're worried about the variance and you're using multiple controls, you might think that like, 
uh, yeah, you, you can't quantify variance well for those, but in experimentation, you're most, I guess, I'm assuming that you're, you care about the means, uh, you're the average treatment effect that you care about is, the, is for the means, which means that like your sampling distribution is normal and then it's usually pretty easy to figure out what the variance of that is. Um, so I'm not super confident like multiple controls will give you better estimations of the variance than just like uh, the data itself or bootstrapping. But if you, yeah, so I guess um, if you did, I guess I'm not sure what the mechanism by which you're using multiple controls is. So like, I guess maybe you can do like control one, control two, and then your treatment. And then uh, you're using these to estimate the variance. And so you're putting that into like some model. You're saying like there's some normal distribution where the mean is, I'm not exactly sure what the approach there is, but the variance is estimated from the differences between these two. Yeah. Um, well, it's specifically in the case of like a small n, the small population size. Mm -hmm. Because like yeah. a large population size, it all works out, right? Yeah, how small? 20. <laughs> oh, OK. Ah, OK. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm less familiar with experiment methodology that's smaller sample sizes like that. So I might not be able to give you a good answer. Rather not spoiled by being in the world of big data. Yeah, rather um, higher in, in terms of population, but um, a low conversion rate, which means uh, you're starved for you're starved for the signal on the conversion side. Oh, okay. I see. Okay. Anyway. Yeah, I'll, let, I'll have to think about that. Maybe um, reach out to me in offline or somebody. If there's somebody else online who knows, I I saw that there are a lot of smart people in this room. So if somebody else knows, feel free to shout out the answer. Otherwise, um, yeah, if I if if I think of something, I can maybe um, you can reach out to me offline. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have two more questions. I think they're going to be maybe shorter questions, so I'll try to fit them both in before we have to sign off at the top of the hour. But uh, the first one is, is the purpose of Epsilon Greedy to maximize revenue while doing an experiment? Is that also the purpose of Thompson sampling? Yeah, they're both algorithms. Like all the multi arm banded algorithms are for minimizing regret. Uh, one way to sort of think about that is by maximizing your reward function, where reward could be revenue. Um, and they tend to do well in different scenarios. Uh, I will say that um, I think on, online in industry, uh, I think most of the literature points to the Thompson sampling working best. Um, there are some challenges with Thompson sampling when you're using uh, non non-binary metrics. So, like a lot of the examples that you'll see in blogs are um, binary metrics because you can use a beta binomial um, update a Bayesian update function. Um, but yeah, so the short answer is, yeah, they're both for minimizing regret. Uh, they just do better under different circumstances. And there's other algorithms as well besides these. Um, and the last question, are there any resources or reading material where I can understand how to define the epsilon um, in an epsilon greedy experiment? Yeah, I think the challenge with um, figuring out what parameters to use on any model is that it's going to be specific to your data set. So I think that like if you're working, if you're in like a product team within a particular company or org, um, I mean, you can just, you, what you should do is you should actually just test Epsilon as like a hyperparameter and figure out which uh, Epsilon works best for your use case. Um, and then it's something where like you can, you know, similar to like how you continue to train models, you can try that out again every six months or something to figure out what's best for you, but it's gonna be uh, case dependent. Um, there's not gonna be like an optimal epsilon greedy that works in all cases, or an op optimal epsilon parameter that works in all cases. All right, well, 
Thank you, Robert. That was that was very uh, interesting. I learned a lot. Uh, thank you for everyone who showed up, and you know, also thank for AI Camp for hosting us and helping us set up the Zoom call. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for having me. All right.